All right, for the next talk, we're going from community back to science. Um, Eric Morgan from uh, BioH Labs is going to give us an idea what they did with like uh, DNA encoded libraries um, and uh, how they're using it in their company to develop novel therapeutics um, against aging. Awesome. Thanks, Max. Uh, it's great to be able to speak to you all today, here in person and online. Uh, the topic today is DNA encoded libraries to discover novel therapeutic molecules for age-related disease. Um, this is uh, not a topic I usually speak on. Um, I usually speak about our platform technologies for discovering uh, translatable targets for aging or our clinical programs, but this is a really useful topic for anyone who has a target and wants to be able to drug that target. And so we'll, we'll talk about that, whether you're in a company or an academic lab. All right, so just first, who are we at BioAge? We're a platform-driven clinical stage biotechnology company. Um, we uh, target mechanisms that are fundamental to aging, and we do that to treat uh, severe diseases um, for an uh, FDA-type regulatory approval pathway. We have a powerful human-first discovery platform. We, we believe in biology that we think will translate to humans because it comes from human data. Uh, we have a number of programs, including um, our lead program, BG105, for uh, muscle aging and also for healthy weight loss. Um, when uh, people get older, they have less muscle, and it's hugely important for their function, uh, for their longevity, and for their systemic health. Um, and uh, there's a lot of potential right now for therapies that can really change obesity and metabolic disease, like CLIP1 agonists. Um, but a huge risk of that, especially for older people, is, is muscle loss. Um, and so that's one of the things we can target uh, with our muscle aging drug. Uh, we also uh, have a number of other programs, including uh, BG100, which targets NLRP3, which is an aging and inflammation target that I'll be speaking about today with relation to DNA encoded libraries. Uh, so this was the alternate uh, title for the talk today. So drug screening at an inconceivably large scale in a very tiny space. And that's sort of a, a brief summary of DNA encoded libraries. And so I'll, I'll uh, tell you more about that. So um, a few years ago, the company New Evolution, which is a DNA encoded library company, made an announcement that they had created a screening library with 40 trillion unique molecules that they could screen against targets. And I just want to pause briefly to reflect on the number 40 trillion. So I'll, I'll, I'll write it here on the screen so you can think about it. Um, not 40 trillion molecules, 40 trillion unique molecules. Um, it's almost inconceivably large. Uh, this is one way to start thinking about it. So um, let's imagine, like in a normal lab scenario, if you have a molecule you want to screen against a compound, you have to put that in a solution in some kind of container. So here's a one mil Eppendorf tube. Um, you could fit probably about a billion of those, which is a huge number already, into an Olympic-sized swimming pool, uh, each one with a different unique molecule. If you wanted to encompass 40 trillion, you'd need 40 thousand Olympic size swimming pools. So it just seems completely logistically infeasible to be able to do this kind of thing. Um, however, it is feasible due to a really conceptually simple but, um, but amazing uh, advance in terms of what it enables. So just to briefly contrast DNA encoded library screening on the right to traditional high throughput screening on the left, um, which is much less high throughput than DNA encoded libraries, um, in case that seems briefly confusing. Um, so traditional high throughput screening screens many thousands to several millions, kind of at the upper extreme, of distinct compounds using a you know, traditional approach where you have your uh, compound of interest and a, a, a container for liquid, like a well on a plate. Um, and then you, uh, for each compound, you have a different well uh, or multiple wells because you want it at different concentrations and you screen it using some kind of um, measurement of whether it's doing something useful, and there's lots of ways to do that. 
Um, it was a huge advance in, uh, you know, in the past. It's been very useful, uh, but relatively speaking, it's super intensive in terms of the space for all the machines and vials and liquids and materials, the time it takes because you have to have um, you know, robots pipetting in and out of each of these individual little containers, um, and then ultimately the cost as a result of that. So DNA encoded library screening through some conceptually simple, but advances that took a long time to, to mature, um, does billions to trillions of unique compounds simultaneously in one container, uh, which takes hugely less space, time, and cost. And this is the key, um, a, one of the key design features here at the bottom, which is that instead of having to know which molecule you're looking at because you, you wrote the label on the outside of the tube, you know, the, you know which, what the identity of your molecule is because of this DNA code that's attached to it. So it's a DNA barcode that lets you uniquely identify a molecular structure based on the sequence. Uh, so if you want to know what it is, you sequence it using DNA sequencing technology. Um, and it's a little more than that. It's also uh, structurally related. So you can see the colors matching up here. So on the right, you have a small molecule, which has green, blue, and red. Uh, pieces to it, and those correspond to the green, blue, and red pieces of DNA. So you can sequentially build up this molecule and add primers, which I'll kind of go through on the next slide, uh, to encode the structure of the molecule you're creating. And the way you do that enables the whole scale of this process, which is via exponential growth. So you start with a building block, one of those little pieces of a molecule, that's the blue circle, and you have a unique tag for that piece of a molecule, that building block, and you stick them both in a well, you ligate it. Now you have a whole bunch of uh, these building blocks which are identical, and they're all labeled with identical tags, so you can continue with this process. You do that, let's say, a thousand times, so you have a thousand different building blocks, a thousand different unique labels, um, and here we've, we're seeing three of them, so green, uh, red and blue, so three, three different building blocks uh, representative of our 1,000 different building blocks, each of which you can read based on its DNA tag. Uh, you, take those, you take those many different uh, pooled building blocks. Uh, well, initially they're separate, you pool them. So now they're in a single test tube. So we went from 1,000 test tubes down to one test tube. Um, and now uh, you have this mixture of different molecules, different colors, in one test tube, um, and you repeat that across, let's say, a thousand other test tubes, and each one of those, you add a different building block. So you can see the orange triangle here. So just focusing on one tube with a thousand different um, initial building blocks, you add one specific on top of that. And so uh, you have now multiplied the number of compounds from a thousand to a thousand times a thousand. So you now have a million unique compounds where you, based on uh, doing a thousand tubes and then a thousand tubes again. So with a relatively small amount of effort, you've created a million unique compounds with a million unique labels, uh, and you're building up this combinatorial process of the chemistry and also of the uh, DNA labels, which you're seeing here. So now you're back to a thousand test tubes uh, containing a million uh, different compounds, and you pull them back into a, one test tube again. So now you have a test tube with a million compounds. You can repeat that again, then you have a billion, then you have a trillion. In practice, I think it's much harder than that, but that's the concept. So now you have a test tube with, let's say, a trillion unique molecular compounds in it. Now comes the second really key advance of this technology, where you can um, take your pool of a trillion compounds, and you can pour it onto a bound target of interest. So that's the, the blue sort of twirly protein there. Um, and by the nature of uh, stereochemistry, some of those compounds will stick um, based on the different building blocks and some of them will not. Then you can wash off the ones that don't stick. So, um, so here you see on the, on the left, you see the green and purple labeled molecule is stuck and everything else hasn't. So then you wash everything else that hasn't, um, and then you use a greater, a greater stringency process, and you then selectively wash off the one that did stick, and then you can sequence it, and that's how you know what, which of your million compounds stuck. Um, in practice, it's not just one. You can have 
many, many, many compounds sticking with different degrees of stringency. And so the high throughput sequencing actually gives you this really complex data set of all the things which stuck to your target of interest um, at different levels of, uh, of affinity. So what you get out of this experiment where you had a single test tube with a trillion compounds is a really um, high density data set of all the things that are sticking to your target where if you use traditional high throughput screening, um, instead of taking a single experiment, it would have taken you know, millions or it would have been infeasible because you wanted to do it a trillion times and uh, that would take a very long time. So um, what can you do with this kind of data set? It's actually um, taken you really far down this path of molecular discovery because out of this data set, you already get initial structure activity relationships. This is the next step. Once you have a molecule and you're trying to uh, figure out how to change it to make it into a better molecule, you start exploring the chemical space around this molecule and uh, trying to figure out how you can make it better. And you already get a lot of that out of this initial high throughput data set. Um, and you can take things that look the best from that data set and use them to start your traditional SAR chemistry. Um, you can also do iterative screens. So you can um, take the hits from your first screen and use those to design a library that's customized to continue your screening, uh, which is really powerful. And you can also use machine learning approaches on these dense data sets that come out of the DNA encoded library uh, experiments to um, again, help you design libraries um, or help you design your own chemistry. So this technology has been uh, revolutionary um, and has led to a number of acquisitions in recent years, which tells you about the value that this has to companies doing drug discovery. So in 2019, um, New Evolution was acquired by Amgen for um, $170 million. In 2020, um, in Citro, uh, acquired Haystack for an undisclosed amount. And then um, just in 2023 now, we have Lilly acquiring Dice Therapeutics for $2.4 billion. So um, clearly there's a lot of value to this technology for, tra for translation um, for large companies, but there's also a lot of value for individual labs and individual small companies uh, by partnering with people who are expert at this. So now that we hopefully understand a little bit more about the technology. Um, I am not an expert on DNA encoded libraries, uh, by the way, um, but I know experts. So um, if anyone wants to talk more about the details, I'm happy to facilitate. So this is the BioAge drug discovery story, how we used uh, DNA encoded libraries uh, to identify a novel class uh, of NLRP3 inhibitors. So first, what I usually talk about, which is our platform for um, discovering important aging biology that we believe will be translational and important for human health. Uh, so it's clear uh, that in the population we have a lot of variation. There's people who live a long time and very healthy and people who live a short time and very unhealthy. And so there's examples all around of us of what it is to be um, a much better ager and a much worse ager. And so that's the variation that we harness with the BioAge human data platform to um, improve human health and find the right translational targets for aging biology. Um, and this is a great example of you know, Robert Marchand who set a record as a competitive cyclist at age 105. Um, be great if we could be more like him. And so we partner with human cohorts where there are uh, people who have been followed for many decades of their aging where we have blood samples at multiple time points, where we know the full life histories of these people, how long they lived, um, and important health outcomes, like on the left here, things like physical function, grip strength, cognitive function, um, and the function of other organs. And this is just a, an inspirational slide to show you 5,000 individual proteins measured in the blood um, of thousands of people as they age and their relationships to future health outcomes for these people. So how long they lived, which is the mortality signal on the y-axis, and then it's been colored for all these different um, important health span endpoints. So uh, this is how we profile different biology uh, within uh, aging, potential aging targets. And the usefulness of a human-centric platform like that is that you can use it to figure out which of all the existing known aging mechanisms, which have mostly come out of model organisms, are likely to translate to, uh, to humans and to be able to you know, possibly become therapies. 
And uh, in addition to that, you can discover things that are completely unknown on the right there, things that might be different about human biology uh, than all the model organisms. And so the specific uh, topic today is a target called uh, NLRP3 for this story of how we used Dell screens. Uh, so NLRP3 came out of uh, our platform uh, as a molecule that, uh, and a pathway that increases in activity over time. On the right, you can see it's a central component of the inflammasome, so it's a mediator of uh, uh, innate uh, immunity. And uh, there's a lot of things that activate it around the, around the outside there, but importantly, they all lead to um, inflammation, which accumulates as you age and is not good for you. And we can see, uh, again, from the human data platform on the lower left that uh, activation of this pathway is very important for risk of mortality over decades in the future in these people, um, and that it also predicts cognitive decline in the future. And we know that um, neuroinflammation is a key hypothesis around uh, the cause of various neurodegenerative diseases. So this is a target that we really wanted to drug, and the question is, um, how to do that, and so we turn to DNA encoded libraries. Um, it's worth noting that there are other molecules in this space. This is a target that's of interest in a number of specific inflammatory diseases as well as for aging, um, and the existing molecules um, had problems for this kind of neuroinflammation uh, application. They don't penetrate the brain, which is really important, and they uh, uh, were associated with some human safety concerns, which we also wanted to overcome. So. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm not a DNA encoded library expert, but Dr. George Hartman is, and uh, so he works with us to run Dell screens, and it's important to um, have an expert to help you design these. We also partnered with HitGen to run the actual screen, and this is what I would suggest for anyone who wants to run their own Dell screen. Uh, HitGen uh, is uh, great to work with, and they offer um, attractive terms for academic labs as well as for uh, as well as for small companies or, or large companies. Um, and uh, we did a relatively small scale there a screen of only 500 billion compounds. And uh, we uh, used a number of strategies to try to get to a, a you know, really good screen and uh, selected for affinity here. So you can see the kind of dense data that comes out of this kind of screen on the left, just representing all these different diverse compounds that stuck to NLRP3 um, in molecular space. And then we used, um, analytic criteria to narrow it down to a smaller number. And then we uh, took that smaller number and we took it into uh, external screens, in vitro screens, and we found an initial hit uh, that had high affinity in LRP3, novel drug-like structure with an open patent landscape um, that was synthetically accessible. We took that through additional SAR and have now nominated BG100 for clinical development. It's our um, CNS penetrant development candidate for as a promising drug for brain aging. Uh, it gets into the brain, which is um, awesome. It's very potent, uh, low toxicity in both in vitro and in vivo studies, uh, has a novel structure and a novel binding site that um, we think will be very exciting for brain aging. As far as ways to take that forward, we are planning to take that first into an initial neuroinflammatory proof of concept indication. And uh, the long-term goal is to treat the you know, constellation of diseases associated with brain aging, um, uh, cognitive impairment generally, and neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative disease. In summary, um, that's what you can do <laughs> with DNA-encoded libraries, is find molecules that actually uh, satisfy all the criteria they need to uh, for drug development. And DELs are a revolutionary modern screening method that's incredibly high throughput, uh, screening billions to trillions of molecules in an unbiased way in a small amount of space and time. Uh, and uh, often reveals families of molecules where you have built-in SAR right, out, right, right from the start. Uh, it is only available to those with the right technology and expertise, but as I said, there are people with this expertise you can partner with, um, and that's often the right way to do it. In our example specifically, we had a target we wanted to drug, uh, and uh, we discovered an inhibitor of, of that target with Dell technology and have ended up now with a uh, potent selective CNS penetrant compound that's uh, orally bioavailable 
uh, with a novel mechanism and a good tox profile. And uh, that's the kind of thing you can get from an excellent uh, drug screening technology. And so you too can use uh, DNA encoded library techniques to screen, screen trillions of compounds and hopefully lead to great new drugs for aging and age related disease. And that's it. <laughs> Anybody has any questions about this cool technology? Yeah, it's a great talk. I was wondering, I mean, you have this uh, very powerful technology to screen trillions of different molecules, but you sort of ended up with one drug, no, that you identified. But I would say, I mean, isn't this, of course, I don't know much about drug screening, but isn't this exactly, uh, I, mean, I mean, couldn't this work very well for finding actually many, many uh, targets, many, many different drugs? Because what you explained, how this DNA encoded screening works is uh, you analyze the sequencing reads. So I would say there are many, many targets and maybe you can see which uh, candidate drug binds the target best because of the number of reads. I, I, I don't know that, but, but I can easily imagine that in aging, which is very complex as we just discussed, you may actually need to go after many drugs that you use together. That I guess also has many regulatory problems is that something that you guys think about? I mean, not one drug, but actually many in combination from the very start, and then see how you can resolve the, all the issues around it? So, so the way you set up these experiments is you choose a specific target, and you screen all of these trillions of compounds or billions of compounds simultaneously against one target. And so you're right, you do get many hits out of that. So many molecules that are potentially good drugs against your one single target. And so I didn't go into that detail, but we actually got families of chemically distinct compounds that all have different properties. So um, it's not, um, you don't get, you have to choose your target. You don't get all the targets at once, but you do get this massive um, complex architecture of potential chemical families that, uh, that are hits against your target. And so you get this diversity of like, you can get oral compounds, IV compounds, brain penetrant, non-brain penetrant, and that develops out of the, the initial screen and then also the subsequent chemistry. Um, and so there is a lot of utility in that diversity, um, but, but it is diversity against the target you screened against. It's not against all biology, just to be clear. Yeah, so, so just to be clear that this talk is about a certain technology that allows you to start with a target of interest and get to a, a, a chemical that can be a drug, to a small molecule drug, which you can uh, use against that target. So, by, you know, aging biology is complex, and this is one way to, you know, to, you, you could run different screens against different targets, and then you can get multiple different hits to then try to combine uh, into, in a combinatorial way, that's certainly, possible, and this would be a more efficient way to do it than traditional screening. But the important point is it's an efficient way to get from your target to something that could be a safe, effective, regulatorily accessible way to actually drug that target. Yeah. Thanks. You said you're not an expert in DNA encoded libraries, so I'm going to ask you a question about DNA encoded <laughs> libraries. Um, so if you have these uh, kind of DNA strands sitting on your small molecule, presumably in some cases where the small molecule would be a, a good binding, it won't be because you've got this tail sticking off it that gets in the way, right? Um, presumably you also have the inverse of that where you may have a molecule that seems like it works, but once you remove that DNA tail off of it, it no longer binds properly. Um, in your experience, how often do you have these I mean, the first one you can't really measure easily, but the, the latter one, how often do you find that once you remove that DNA strand, the small molecule no longer works? Um, that's a good question. I think the, the follow-up process that I mentioned, where, you know, you take it out of the, out of the I think there's a, there's a word for it, which is like the DNA-free process, you know, when you take off the DNA and then you're just working in plates again with the actual molecule, that's gonna, what's going to tell you whether that's happened or not. Um, I don't know how often that happens, but clearly you can weed those out very quickly afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll. I'll there we go. I'll, that's all. That Paul, did you want to address that? How often? Or yeah. 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 Uh, okay. I think, I think we just recently spoke with Hitchin, and they alluded to that. The other possibility is not necessarily finding multiple compounds, multiple targets. One of the issues is contractually, they're probably not going to do that unless you're willing to pay for every single target that you're that you're looking at. So that. That's a problem from uh, what, what you'll end up owing the company. But I think they can also find bispecific molecules, and they've looked at it, where, where you can find one molecule that binds to two separate 
targets. Okay, so that's the question about the diversity of biology there. Was you can you can screen for targets that do but, or drugs that do hit multiple but, but targets. But the DNA hypothetically two. could bind to the part of the molecule that is the one that would be binding to your protein of interest. Yeah. So it is possible. Yeah. So DNA is a potential confounder. Just to summarize, it, that it, it, it it's it's an issue with the yeah. technology. The, but, but it's it, still it's it's surmountable. It, you, you, yeah. Well, you, it's it's overwhelmed by sheer numbers. So I think that's the uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you have like you know, many many copies of this target in solution, and the DNA is you know having uh, assuming different configurations, and so it won't mess your experiment up in every case unless it has to do with the place it's found, and then you might want to try binding it to a different part of the of the molecule. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. If we don't have any more questions, then. Uh, Thank you again, thank you again, Eric.